Um, and this day is a special day on, on climate change, uh, which is, you know, on, on, on our minds, especially after the summer, um, but generally also, because there's a lot of stuff going on in, in terms of policy um, and, and, you know, geopolitical events and so on. Um, and uh, I think central banks are also spending efforts trying to at least understand the, this a little bit better. Um, and you know, they're part of the policy toolkit, so it's important that you know, we de develop models there um, and collect better data. And uh, you know, at, at the heart of all of this is trying to understand uh, uh, what, what's going on in terms of economics. And uh, we're very delighted today to have a, a great program which starts with uh, John Hasler, who has really gone very deep under the hood and, and, and understood uh, the modeling and, and, and uh, the economics of climate change. Um, so uh, you, you were giving the, the keynote address here. Uh, and thank you so much for, for coming. Um, and I, I will just hand over the, the mic to you. And I should say um, uh, there's a huge virtual floor here. Um, so, you know, this uh, live stream then hopefully will reach a, a, lot of, a lot of hearts and minds of, of people. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much all for, for coming virtually and in, in real life. Uh, let's see if we can get my presentation up on the, on the screen here. Meanwhile, I will say some uh, advertisements about uh, the economics of climate change. I think it's uh, a very interesting topic and I've been focusing on this for the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, and I've discovered that if you just come above the hurdle of understanding a bit of the natural science, really standard macroeconomics is extremely useful for understanding the interaction between climate and, and the economy and, and what kind of policies work and which don't. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Climate change, is there a realistic, is there a realistic solution? <clears throat> we quite often hear that the pla planet is in dire straits. We read about it in the media and hear policymakers everywhere talk about it. Uh, um, and what we hear is that the climate crisis acutely threatens the survival of mankind and that we are close to tipping points. Uh, and if we pass them, uh, climate change will accelerate very abruptly and make this will basically make it too late to do anything. Uh, to make things worse, the solutions are very costly and require uh, a complete change of lifestyle, uh, degrowth, uh, uh, in particular in the Western world, and you know, uh, an end to growth in China, uh, uh, an unseen structural change of our economy, and basically a new economic system. And I guess this, this is the kind of picture that, that, that you see when you hear these things. I will here uh, provide a quite different picture than, than this one. Uh, uh, and I will base it on economics, of course, but also on uh, the natural science uh, results as they come out from uh, the UN's climate panel, IPCC. <clears throat> so let me start there with, uh, with the natural science on the greenhouse effect. And uh, CO2 in the atmosphere uh, affects something that you can call the Earth's energy budget, namely an account of the inflow of energy from the sun to Earth and the outflow of energy to space. And, and uh, when the climate is in uh, a steady state, uh, this energy budget in an average sense is balanced. <clears throat> but more CO2 in the atmosphere uh, changes this, this energy budget by reducing the outflow. And, and that uh, creates a surplus in the energy budget. And, and with that surplus, energy has accumulated in Earth. And that leads to higher global temperatures which will eventually increase the outflow. So in the end, the energy budget will be uh, in balance. So the balance will be restored. But of course, the problem is that that uh, uh, is happening at the higher temperature. So 
Uh, and it's well known that this surplus in the energy budget is proportional to the percentage increase in the CO2 concentration. And, and we get around 0 0.05 watts per square meter on average over the whole world and over the year in additional surplus for uh, every percent increase in the CO2 concentration. And this was quantified a long time ago by by Arrhenius, uh, who was a national scientist in, in, in Sweden. And the mechanism here is that the inflow of sunlight is in the form of high frequency uh, electromagnetic radiation. The outflow is, is largely in, apart from some direct reflection, in the form of uh, heat waves, low frequency uh, at least compared to sunlight, uh, electromagnetic radiation. And when, when, uh, uh, when that radiation passes through uh, um, the atmosphere, greenhouse gases take up that energy by starting to vibrate at approximately the same frequencies as this, this, this infrared radiation. Uh, pretty much like uh, cutlery starts to vibrate when, when a bass guitar is playing in a, in a bar. And that basically means that uh, the atmosphere works as, as a blanket. It doesn't let through the infrared radiation, and the energy has to come up uh, in the atmosphere until an altitude is reached where the greenhouse gas concentration is so low so the energy can be released into space as infrared. So that works like a blanket. That blanket is around 5,000 meters, uh, we can think of, and, and with, if we double the CO2 concentration, you get a couple of hundred meters more. And with a thicker blanket, uh, you get higher temperature at the, at the bottom, uh, pretty much like you use a blanket in, in your bed. So this is pretty well understood, and it's been known for, for at least 100 years, and you can verify it in, in, in high school experiments if you want to. But it's hard to verify a couple of uh, feedback mechanisms. And, and uh, uh, cloud formation is probably the most uh, important source of uncertainty here. Uh, and the reason is that cloud formation is affected by, by climate change, by, by the, the amount of greenhouse gases, but it's also affected by other things that we do. We emit particles and so on. And it's very important for whether this strengthens or weakens the direct effect where uh, clouds are formed, at which altitude, at which latitude, if it's during the day or the night and the season and all these kinds of things. And these are difficult to predict. And we all know that, that, that this is important. Uh, in, uh, at least if we are up in, in, in Sweden, uh, we know that you know, uh, a winter night is colder if there's no clouds. Uh, so then clouds kind of have uh, a warming effect. But of course in the summer and here, uh, clouds have a cooling effect instead. So it matters a lot what kind of cloud formation uh, is affected. And, and also whether this is kind of a temporary effect from particles or if it's more like a permanent effect. And all this means that, you know, we, uh, the conclusion is that more CO2 leads to, to global warming, but it's hard to say how much. Okay. so. Uh, in, the, in the end, we're not so really, when we talk about policy, we're mostly interested in uh, the relation between emissions and, uh, and, and, and climate change. Not so much about the CO2 concentration. We have to take also uh, the mechanism whereby emissions affect the CO2 concentration into account. And then, uh, re fairly recently, uh, a quite surprising result came out of the most advanced uh, uh, climate models, and that is that uh, climate change, as measured by the increase in the global mean temperature, is approximately proportional to the stock of accumulated global emissions. So if we write it in equations here, if you think about T atom here as the the, the, the increase in the global mean temperature, that's proportional to the sum over time from time zero. So when we started to emit like 150 years or so ago, uh, the, from then accumulated emissions up until today, that's uh, where the temperature uh, should be today. 
Uh, and that also means that you can predict what the temperature is going to be in the future just by counting how much more we have accumulated until that day. So emissions here, EMS, is global emissions at time s, and you sum them from time zero, so like when uh, we started industrializing our, our economies, and sum up to t and multiply by, by uh, a proportionality constant here. <clears throat> And this, of course, if you see that, that implies that uh, temperature is going to increase as long as emission continue. And, and an immediate conclusion from this is that we cannot continue to, uh, uh, to emit forever. We have, at some point in time, we, we have to, to stop emitting. Uh, another thing that comes out is that climate change stops, uh, approximately at least, if we stop emissions. And that, that is uh, surprising to many, uh, but it's relatively straightforward to, to, to explain the mechanism behind here. And that is that we have two forces uh, that affect the climate uh, in opposite directions. And basically, by accident, they balance each other for a long time, hundreds of years. And that is that CO2 slowly leaves the atmosphere uh, 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 over time if we have stopped accumulating more. And when uh, CO2 leaves the atmosphere, then of course the gre direct greenhouse effect is, is weakened. And the other effect is that oceans slowly get warmer and warmer. They, uh, the fact that oceans uh, are cooler that they want, than, than what they're going to be in the long run when we have stopped emissions, have a cooling effect on the atmosphere. And that cooling effect also diminish over time and approximately at the same rate. So let me use an equation here again. And this is actually the, the, uh, an expression of that energy budget that I talked about in the, uh, in the last pa page, uh, in the last slide. <clears throat> and, to the left here, we have the change in, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in the temperature of Earth, or the global mean temperature of the atmosphere, the change per unit of time. And to the right, we have within parentheses an account of that energy budget that I was talking about, the, the account of, and this is now just for, for the atmosphere. And, 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 and we have that being multiplied by, a, by um, um, parameter sigma 1, which is positive. And that means that if everything in the parentheses, the energy budget for the atmosphere, is in surplus, temperature is increasing, and, and vice versa. So now let's look at the three terms within the parentheses. The first one is the, uh, the greenhouse effect. And, and that says that the greenhouse effect is then a function of the logarithm of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So that, that's what I said before, that it's the percentage increase that matters. So that's a log logarithmic relation. The second term is the other uh, effect that when, when the temperature increases uh, in the atmosphere, you get more energy outflow. Uh, so that uh, has a negative impact on the energy budget. And then the third term is the, uh, the cooling effect of the, uh, uh, of the oceans. And you see that here, uh, that depends on uh, the difference in the temperature in the atmosphere and the temperature in the oceans, both measured over and above their values when we started emitting. Uh, so when we started emitting things, then uh, both these terms were zero. But now the temperature in the atmosphere has gone up uh, by a little bit more than one degree, but the oceans haven't had time yet to, to, to increase their temperature much. So that's a cooling effect as long as this is the case, and that has a negative impact. Now, if you have uh, 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 a non-balance, so like a surplus in this energy budget, the atmospheric temperature adjusts pretty quickly. Uh, so the middle term there adjusts pretty quickly. So when we have stopped emitting CO2, 
we, uh, we relatively quickly, so within a decade or so, have a balance in the energy budget <clears throat> by the temperature in the atmosphere having uh, adjusted to, to the other terms. After that, you see that the first term falls over time because you get less and less CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, and that has a negative impact uh, on the energy budget. And the third term, uh, uh, that also falls in absolute value because the ocean becomes warmer and warmer. And, but that has a positive effect on the energy budget, and the first and the third term balance each other in the, in the, uh, in, for, for hundreds and perhaps thousands of years, approximately, making it possible for the middle term to, to be at the constant level. So, so that's, uh, uh, that's, that's surprising, uh, but it's very convenient. It implies that we have this proportionality uh, that, that I talked about in the beginning. So that's convenient. The problem is, of course, that this proportionality, this, so this, uh, this result is common to, to all the big uh, 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 climate models uh, that are, are used, uh, these supercomputer models that actually essentially are weather forecast models that you run for, for 100 years or so. Uh, but the problem is that they don't agree, these models, they agree on the proportionality, but they don't agree on the proportionality factor. So if you look at what IPCC and their last report say, they say that likely, probably, and they, they actually say that that means with two-thirds probability, I think that's a little bit, you know, they can't be that precise, but that's what they say anyway. That proportionality constant is between 0.27 and 0.63 degrees per teraton of, uh, uh, of, of accumulated CO2 emissions. Um, and, and as this uh, range wide, yes, it is pretty wide. So we can see that by, by noting that we have so far uh, uh, emitted around 2.4 teratons of CO2 since we started like 150 years ago. And thus, thus this, this has, ha has committed us to between 0.65 and 1.5 degrees, just multiplying these numbers with, uh, with the end points of, of this range. So in a sense, if, if it were the case that the lower range here is the right one, then we can continue emitting like we do now globally for, for 70 or 100 years without reaching the one and a half degree uh, line. The things that we see now is mostly temporary and will vanish when we stop emitting uh, carbon particles and, and, and things like that. But it could also be that it's already too late, that we have already breached the one and a half degree limit. <clears throat> Uh, we can also use it to say that global emissions today are around 40 gigatons of CO2, and that adds like between 0.1 and a quarter degree per decade. <clears throat> uh, I said on the first slide that there is a, uh, many uh, are very worried about closely approaching tipping points, um, but there the IPCC is pretty clear in saying that there is no evidence of such nonlinear responses uh, at the global scale in climate projections for the next century, uh, where instead that linear proportionality is, is, is holding. It doesn't mean that you can't rule it out, of course, uh, and it does not mean that you don't uh, expect uh, tipping points at regional levels, uh, like the dieback of the Amazon or, or maybe uh, uh, the, that the Arctic ice, or probably more the Antarctic ice, suddenly uh, 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 diminish in, in, in size and so on. But at the global scale, no, uh, no at least no evidence of this. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about the economic effects of climate change. I don't have time for this, but um, uh, you can, we, we have shown that in terms of their, the impact on policy, the uncertainty is about the same in, uh, uh, in the economic consequences of, of climate change, where the midpoint estimates are not, doesn't seem very uh, worrisome. IPCC says that a few percent of, of GDP might be lost uh, at the end of the century, and, 
And um, uh, there's a nice uh, study called the Peseta project, uh, financed by the Commission, where, do can, where they do like a bottom-up study of European consequences for climate change, current consequences in Europe, and they come also to, to a few percent uh, uh, as measured of, of, of our GDP. But the uncertainty range is very, very wide. Uh, it's, it's very hard to take this point estimates at, you know, as, as, uh, as, as the truth. <clears throat> uh, so, so there is a very high uncertainty about the climate sensitivity to emissions and about the sensitivity of welfare to, to climate change. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem that this uncertainty is, is going to vanish in the short run. Um, in my thesis, I, I wrote about uh, irreversible investments and uncertainty, and I showed that you know if there is large uncertainty, uh, there is a strong value to wait and see. Wait and see, uh, but that comes from you know the information flow. You learn by waiting. But here, it seems like we are probably not going to learn in the short run uh, where these sensitivities are. And, and the ranges that I spoke about on the last slide, they haven't shrunk, at least not much, uh, over the 30 years, for example, where we have had the IPCC. So, and that means that wait and see is probably not a good strategy. <clears throat> uh, the problem here is that uh, although IPCC puts probabilities on things, I don't think one can uh, take that very seriously. I would rather say that uncertainty is Nietzschean. Uh, uh, we, we, we cannot put uh, probabilities on the likelihood that we are in the lower or the upper uh, ends of the range of, of climate sensitivities. And the same thing with you know, the, the consequences of, of, of uh, climate change for welfare. Uh, what is the cost of, of a large reallocation of, of, of people from areas where it's going to be perhaps too, uh, too, uh, uh, too warm to, to live? And what is the likelihood that when it becomes uh, sometimes of the year impossible to be out working in the fields in India, what's the likelihood that that will happen before they get air-conditioned tractors uh, or, 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 or not? Uh, that's, that's impossible to put probabilities on. So then uh, um, we, uh, we argue, and then I think that's a no-brainer, that we need to find a robust policy, uh, a policy that works under several uh, possible uh, futures, and it could be the case that that doesn't exist, and that would be the case if it's true what, what was written on the first slide that I talked about, uh, that, you know, uh, we don't really know uh, if this is a very, very big problem or not, uh, but if we want to do something about it, we know that it costs a lot. Then it's a wicked problem. You, you, can, you get screwed whatever you do uh, with, with a high likelihood. So we, uh, we have used in our research um, a very simple solar type model with different energy inputs uh, uh, and to see if we can kind of say something about these things. Um, so uh, this model exists in, uh, in a very simple framework, actually. My, my colleague, Per Crusell, who likes heavy computing, he's a little bit uh, ashamed that we, there is a version of this in Excel, but uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing. It's very simple. We can solve it analytically almost uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, even in Excel. It builds on, on the climate module in Nordhaus that has this energy budget uh, that I talked about. A linear energy budget and a linear um, model of how carbon circulates between re different reservoirs. So that's also very simple. And there is a nice paper uh, by, by Foline et al. Uh, that you see here on the slide that shows that that very simple five equation linear dynamic system extremely well captures the dynamics of the most advanced uh, climate models. We need those to verify that it works, but we don't need to use those supercomputer models in our uh, economic models. <clears throat> okay, uh, and what we do there is, uh, in, in, in when we use that model, is that we show that even such simple models uh, can uh, be useful in a search for a robust policy. Um, so we, uh, we, uh, we use that model 
to look at two kinds of policies. Uh, one is the precautionary policy, so setting a, a fairly high global emission price, uh, assuming a high climate sensitivity and, and, and high sensitivity of welfare to climate change. That would be kind of optimal in that, under that scenario. Um, and the other is hope for the best, so assuming low sensitivities and calculate what would be the right policy uh, 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 in that case. And, and here, in a sense, we verify what's sometimes called the PINDEC critique, that there is large uncertainty about parameters, and if you look for optimal policies, uh, uh, they are very sensitive to what you assume about those parameters that we know very little about. Uh, and that, I think that's true if you use the model to look for optimal policies. But if you use the model to look for robust policies, uh, the critique doesn't really apply anymore. So that's what we do. We focus what happens if the opposite scenario to, which, to that which would make the policy optimal happens. So what happens if uh, you, you uh, choose the precautionary policy and it turns out that sensitivities are low. How much is the cost of that policy mistake? And vice versa, hope for the best, low sensitivities, and then it turns out that sensitivities are high, what's the cost of that policy mistake? And that's, that's kind of the relevant issue for, for robustness. And, and this, is, uh, uh, this is the result, and these are then the, the losses over time uh, of the policy mistakes, so not of climate change, but of the policy mistakes, so the kind of the regret that you would do when you realize that you chose the, the wrong policy uh, uh, over time, and, and it's, it's measured as a percent of, of, of consumption. And the two upper ones are the consequences if you hope for the best and it turns out that that was a bad policy. And the two lower ones are the precautionary policies and it turns out that it was not necessary. So there's a very large asymmetry here in the two and the two, the, for the two types of policies. And you see for each of the two types here we have uh, two uh, different calibrations uh, in terms of how easy it is to switch to green technologies. And, and the black one there is when it's relatively easy to, to switch to, black, black, uh, to, to green technologies. The elasticity of substitution between green and black is a little bit higher than in the pink dashed one. And you see that that makes things even more asymmetric. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, what is the intuition for this? Uh, well. Uh, the intuition, I think, can be derived by looking at costs and benefits of mitigation separately. So the cost of, of, of mitigation, of introducing, a, a, for example, an emission price, uh, is the distortionary effect of emission pricing holding climate change constant. Uh, if you tax emissions and you hold uh, climate change uh, constant, the tax has a distortionary effect. And the benefit is, of course, that if it turns out that sensitivities are high, um, uh, it's good that we uh, mitigate the emissions and reduce them uh, uh, because you get less climate change. And then the marginal cost of introducing an emission price is actually zero at zero, right? Uh, but on the other hand, provided that climate change is an issue, the marginal benefit of mitigation is strictly positive at zero. So, and that is basically the, the reason for, for why you get this asymmetry. So the conclusion is that a, reasonable, a reasonably high price on emissions is a robust policy. Uh, how high? Well, uh, like the current EU ETS price. Uh, and in other work uh, that uses much more kind of structural and detailed models of the economy, uh, it's shown that, that that would take us to climate neutrality approximately in, by 2050, and that can really be done without uh, uh, more than marginal consequences for growth. So there's a nice study in, in the World Economic Outlook in October showing this. And, and this is a graph uh, for that. So this is 
this is basically the, that, that the, the GDP effect of introducing a price and combining that with some other investment policies and so on for different regions of the world. And you see that uh, over time here to 2050, the accumulated effect by, by, by then introducing that, that price and moving to climate neutrality by 2050, that's, ba that's zero. Uh, apart from, from, from Russia and OPEC, of course, and, but Russia, of course, have, have other problems too. Uh, but but for, the, for, the, for the other economies, including Africa and India, you don't see marginal effects. The economy is flexible in the long run. Uh, now what we see is, of course, an inflexibility in the short run in, in Europe, uh, but in the long run. So I, I often say that... Uh, the economy is Leontief in the short run, but Cobb Douglas in the long run. And over 30 years, the Cobb Douglas assumption is the right one, and, and this is shown here. <clears throat> okay, so the other conclusion from that is that uh, the marginal value, as I said, of a low emission price is high, and that also implies that it's very important that all parts of the world contribute. If, if all parts of the world uh, don't contribute, so some are not there, it's going to be very difficult for the others to compensate. And we can use our simple model to, to quantify that too. So that we did here. So we analyzed the consequences if China or Africa and India uh, are not uh, doing their uh, uh, share. So they don't do, do anything. And, 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 and the rest of the world needs to, to price them higher to comp or to compensate for the, for the shortfall of either China or Africa and India. And, and here in the, in the upper uh, uh, figure here, we show the, the welfare costs if Africa and India are not participating. And, and we see that Africa and India, they, 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 they do actually in this simulation, they gain a little bit, a few percentage points of GDP. But the other countries lose a much more, actually, every region more, lose more than the, the accumulated benefits of, of Africa and India because they need to, to, to be much more aggressive. And it turns out that they need to have a five times higher tax if Africa and India uh, on, on emissions and Af if Africa and India are not there. Uh, if China is not in, then we need a 20 times higher tax and, 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 and we see a similar uh, consequence there and uh, actually in fact what we needed to do in this simulation is to say that they need to do a little bit otherwise it's impossible to compensate so they they introduced a very low but insufficient tax rate and, and the rest of the world then compensated for that by having 20 times higher and this is of course not possible uh, so, so I've talked about uh, taxes, and, 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 and uh, by the way, I, I don't think one should use the, the word tax. It's really a fee of using a natural resource, namely the atmosphere's ability to absorb CO2. So it's not a tax. Uh, it's, it's a fee uh, for, for using that. Uh, but nevertheless, it has, uh, so, and, and, that, um, and that price then should kind of be set uh, to in, in accordance with the, with the externality, and that's how we economists think about it. But it seems like this way of thinking is less natural to voters and policymakers, and, and what we see is that on the other hand, emission trading systems seem more natural to many policymakers, and, and it seems to be the preferred choice in many countries, also actually including China. Um, and, and I think the, the, the major benefit is that if you talk about the price on emissions, we always have the discussion of, is it enough? Uh, is it going to deliver the, in, uh, uh, the amount of, of emission reductions that we want? Uh, and, and we can't really answer that, but uh, an emission trading system, if you instead choose that policy, you'd never have that issue. Uh, it's that, that you bound the emissions, and that seems to be uh, in the preferences of people who are policymakers, a very uh, large advantage. Um, <clears throat> and the way uh, I, I often, um, you know, explain the value of, of, a, um, uh, of an emission trading system is by, by referring to the fact that the, that proportionality between accumulated emissions and temperature. Uh, also implies that if you have a temperature target, you can calculate the emission budget. Uh, and, and we, I guess, we've all heard about uh, emission budgets for, for various uh, temperature targets. 
Um, um, and the, we can think of that carbon budget as a natural resource in scarce supply. And, and it's then obvious that any time when you have a natural resource in scarce supply, whether it be fish in the ocean, trees in the forest, or this, uh, the Earth's atmosphere's limited capacity to absorb CO2, when you have a situation like that, it cannot be up for grabs for free. You need to have, uh, put bounds on the use. Uh, and then if you think about it in that way, emission trading system is a natural solution. And it seems arguably easier to explain that logic to people than that marginal damages need to be internalized by the private agents. That's kind of, it's a hard line to explain to policymakers. I guess you have, you have discovered yourself, at least. Uh, so, so, and this is what EU has chosen. And I'm, I'm going to say a few words about the EU policy because I think it's very important to take that into account in, in modeling. So uh, the EU Commission uh, proposed last summer um, a lot of stuff, but I think it's three that are very good and very important. Uh, and they actually can take us to, to climate neutrality in the EU in, uh, well before 2050. And the first one is uh, de-escalation of the issuance of EU ETS allowances at a faster rate than, than previously. And the end date of emission allowances is going to be 2040 according to the new proposal and the total emissions are going to be 16 billion tons. So here are the, 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 the slowest emission phase out uh, is, uh, was decided first. Uh, and then uh, four years ago, the blue uh, was uh, implemented. And now the proposal is the black. So you see that you get about half as much emissions uh, in, the, in the future as, as according to, common, uh, to, to the current rules if this is implemented. The second is a new emission trading system for transport and heating, and issues there is going to end in 2044, and this is the proposed amount of emission allowances in these systems uh, over time. So you see a phase out to 2044. And the third one is a faster reduction in the requirements on maximum uh, 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 CO2 emissions from cars uh, that are sold, uh, so all manufacturers have a limit on that, and that's going to be uh, uh, shrunk at the faster rate, and by 2035 uh, to zero, so after that it's not going to be allowed to sell any fossil fuel cars. So this basically gave full control over almost all future CO2 emissions in the Union, and the accumulated emissions in those systems is going to be around 27 uh, billion tons. So that's 60 tons per, per EU citizen. And that's, that's pretty tough, but it really puts that limit in place. Uh, it, you can use those uh, numbers that are for the proportionality that I talked about before and to note that this contributes about 0.02 degrees uh, to final global warming. It also, by the way, implies that if we were kind of to... Uh, immediately take away all fossil fuel emissions. We would, the world would gain 0 0.02 uh, degrees, and that would, if we kind of let that instead be taken out in more em emissions by, by the rest of the world, India and Africa could kind of delay their emission reductions by a year or two. So it's not more than that. <clears throat> it's interesting to note that if the rest of the world introduced similar policies, so implying that you have 60 ton per world citizen over the future. Uh, then that's going to give you, it's uh, easy to calculate, around 480, I forgot, billion tons of CO2 emissions. <clears throat> and the IPCC's global uh, uh, budget for one and a half degrees is 400 gigatons, and for two degrees, it's 1150 gigatons. So you see that if everyone does like EU proposes, uh, then we are very close to the one and a half degree uh, global carbon budget, uh, and very much below the one for two degrees. So this is fully consistent with the Paris Agreement ambition. Of course, there are other things in the Paris too that we should help the third world and so on, but when it comes to emission reductions, I think this is very much in line with, with the Paris Agreement. So this has strong implications for national policy. Um, 
I think that one of the important thing is that if we put these bounds on emissions in EU uh, as a whole, we don't really need to think about you know, where these emissions are, are uh, occurring. It doesn't matter if they occur in Spain or Sweden. It doesn't matter if they occur by, by people uh, uh, from Barcelona uh, flying to Sweden. Or, or It doesn't matter at all. So this idea of calculating footprints, carbon footprints within the union makes very little sense uh, when we have these things put in place. When we don't have these things in put in place, then it makes sense. But uh, with uh, a system that puts the, the, the borders uh, and makes sure that that's going to be what it is, it doesn't matter where, where emissions are taking place. And if we in Sweden, for example, reduce our emissions, uh, the um, all else equal, that's going to lead to more emissions somewhere else. And that's not, that's not, a, that's not a, a fault of the system. That's exactly how it's constructed to be. Uh, so then the policy should focus on making the transition smooth so that the system doesn't lose its political and popular support. And, and, and there, you know, society needs to work. So all kinds of policies that make society work within those limits, uh, that's, that's what, what climate policy needs to do if we talk about climate policy within Europe. <clears throat> and, 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 and I think that this is, so this is going to force a transition to climate neutrality. Um, in my view, it's kind of obvious that this transition is, is uh, not more fundamental or, or than, than other transitions that uh, society, our societies have went through, like industrialization and now digitalization. So it's, it's, that's not what making this transition different. Uh, the difference is that the phase out of CO2 uh, uh, requires policies. So the analog society, that's going to phase out itself, regardless of whether people think it's fair or not. That's not going to happen with, with, with this. And, and that's the main difference. Not that it's so enormously difficult to make the transition. As I said, over 30 years, uh, we have a Cobb Douglas economy in, in basically everything. So it's not going to be very difficult to switch to, to, to other sources of energy than the ones we have now. In the short run, Leontief problems, but not in the long run. And the phase out that we see from the EU system, that's exactly what we want. Uh, there's been calculations of how much of this is going to uh, induce lifestyle changes, and, and, and it seems pretty little. Actually, most of it is going to uh, be, be, be done by, by technological change that implies that we can do to a large extent similar things that we have done so far, but with, with other inputs. <clears throat> So another thing, no climate and finance, I'm, I'm, I think I'm be, be uh, done in five minutes. Uh, so climate and finance. So the EU is proposing other things too. And, and the taxonomy, for example, is, is of course very costly, not the least in terms of how many people are, are working on it. But it seems to me that it's, uh, it's useless uh, given uh, the new rules, at least when it comes to investments within Europe. Uh, uh, the, the idea of, or the kind of, when we, when we analyze as economists this system, we, we see that kind of private incentives uh, are aligned with climate objectives if these things are put in place. Uh, so, so why do we need to have a, some uh, bureaucrat from, um, from Brussels said, a micromanagement of the capital markets in line with the Paris Agreement? We don't need that. Uh, Green bonds, I think, are hardly key for the transition either. It seems like, you know, as long as, as uh, uh, it's profitable to produce, say, electric cars, uh, capital is going to be there. It's not going to be a problem. Uh, I think we need to do more on financial stability risks associated with, for example, stranded assets or... Uh, uh, or policy changes, and, but here I think that there is nothing that points that these things are qualitatively or even quantitatively different from, from other risks to, to financial stability. And standard policy as well as standard ways of calculating these things should be applied. And, and the little I've seen in this area does not point to, to large uh, risks, uh, neither for, stri for, for, for stranded assets nor for kind of abrupt policy shifts. <clears throat> Uh, if you look at calculations of, of how much additional investments is going to be needed for the green transition, you find that it's not trivial. Uh, 
uh, uh, IEA uh, 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 calculated to be in the order of two percentage point of GDP globally, and that's a lot, of course. Uh, but it, it means that we go back to the average investment rates in the world that we had between 1970 and 2000. So, so it's substantial, but it's not unseen historically. <clears throat> and given the kind of the high savings rates that we see, it seems to be doable, this too. <clears throat> so now two uh, slides of conclusions. Uh, so when it comes to policy first, um, even a fairly modest uh, emission price is quite effective in dealing with, with climate change, and it reduces use and steers technological change in, in, in the right direction, and for pedagogical reasons, maybe emission trading systems is, is better than, than a price. We need to have some price, either through an emission uh, trading system or, 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 or a fee, uh, basically everywhere. We can't do it without China, Africa, and, and India. Uh, but it's not very important to have the price exactly the same everywhere. Uh, that's, uh, so we don't need to, to think about that. Uh, of course, if we have emission trading systems in, in the big regions of the world, the price of emission rights is not going to be the same, but it's, it's not of first order importance to, to align those prices. Uh, so making the world climate neutral to 2050 can be done at the reasonable costs, and, and it is a cheap insurance. We cannot really, as economists, show that this, this is the optimal policy, but it is a cheap insurance. It is a robust policy uh, and, and, and should be seen as a high, potentially highly valuable insurance. EU is now on its way to do what's required when, in terms of mitigation of CO2, uh, and... and, and uh, I believe that with the right policies, we, this can be done pretty smoothly. A thing that I haven't talked about, but that I have worked a little bit about, is that we might also consider developing a plan B. It could be that you know, it's even worse than what I've said, said so far. We can't rule out tipping points. They are not in the projections and probably not going to happen, but who knows? And, and for that, uh, geoengineering plans should be prepared. And they should be necessarily be plan Bs. They are not plan As, but they, they might turn out to be valuable as a plan B in a very low probability event. <clears throat> so I think there are strong reasons to be cautiously optimistic about climate change. Uh, and finally, then, some suggestions for research. Um, and I guess I, I've already touched on, on my view that, you know, spending a lot of time on, on refining cost-benefit-based uh, integrated assessment models, coming up with the optimal tax, I, th I think that's, uh, that's uh, a bit of a dead end. I don't think it's, it's, it's not going to be convincing. Uh, our first paper, me and Pat Grisell and some others, that, that was, that was labeled Optimal Climate Policy, and, and now our last is called Suboptimal Climate Policy, so we have kind of moved in that direction, and I suggest that other people do that too. Uh, <clears throat> uh, then I think it's very important. I see a lot of papers on, on, on uh, climate policy not taking into account uh, what's happening on, on, uh, with climate policy so, uh, in, in, in Europe. Uh, so we need to take that into our models and realize that we have the waterbed effects, we put the limits on aggregate emissions and so on, and, and take that into account. Otherwise, I don't think there is much policy relevance in the models. Uh, I think that it seems now pretty likely that, that these plans will uh, be implemented. Uh, uh, they have support from, from, the, uh, from the EU Parliament, who really wants to go a little bit further. All the, the climate ministers said yes uh, this summer, and, and it points that everything points towards that, that these things are going to be put in place. <clears throat> and then research really needs to focus on, how, if, if we talk about European policies, how this can be, can be done uh, smoothly. So how can the transition that's going to be forced by, by this, you know, cement producers, airlines and so on, that don't have fossil-free alternatives by 2040 when emission rights are not going to be sold anymore, they have to go 
go to, to bankrupt, stop their business. So all these things are forced by the policies, and, and, um, but we need to make the transition smooth, otherwise the yellow vests and so on are gonna throw these policies overboard. So uh, are there really important obstacles to here? Are there uh, market failures? Is, how large is the risk for uh, carbon leakage, how can we, you know, introduce technology transfers and so on. That's, that's where I think we need a lot of more re uh, research. And, and uh, when it comes to financial stability, that of course is a big concern for central bankers, um, I think that we need to do more there too. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussions about financial stability, but um, uh, we need to kind of to identify those and, and quantify them and, and, and I, I'm pretty sure the kind of standard methods can, can be, be done here and, and when I see the little that's been done so far, I, I don't get very worried. Uh, policy changes like the one when it became clear that you know, it's likely that the EU policies um, uh, are going to be implemented, that leads to fairly large shifts in profitabilities of some firms and, and the EU emission prices, and we have seen that, but it didn't really cause any financial